Okay. Because they really don't have any relationship to one another. I saw a survey recently that said the American public is very, if you put the crisis of the economy, energy, health care, and there was something else, and they were rating how important are these. Um, the economy obviously was number one, but interestingly enough, energy was very low on that list. Mm -hmm. uh, a reverse of that same survey asked how important is energy to the economy, and we got very high marks. Yeah. It's very important. Yeah. So I think that there does need to be some definitional process that happens here. Uh, See, as long, as long as we have the the you know um, majority of energy voices saying these really aren't problems this is just a one more temporary hiccup mm -hmm. or as long as we keep running these ads that i incessantly see of the api with a lady walking across america saying america has so many energy resources it's going to be pretty far-fetched to think we're going to wake up to the severity of our problems mm -hmm. and it and it and it paints the handful of people I think know what they're talking about as a bunch of alarmists. Uh, but so I guess I, just like somebody a year ago would have been, you know, saying I think we're going to melt down the financial system. So what worries me is I probably suspect we're going to have to run out of gas before we wake up to this, and by then the barn is burned down. Well, and I think what we're missing are some of the warning signs. Oh, we've totally missed them. Uh, look, look at what look at what the dialogue was in July when oil prices were you know, up around 135 to $145 a barrel, mm -hmm. find the speculator and punish him. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, just, I sat there in May and saying, we haven't a clue what's going on. I mean, it, and then there are an enormous amount of energy pundits that, that basically believe that the only reason prices went up is the dollar was weak. Mm -hmm. And I say, excuse me, in a 10 year period of time, the oil prices went up 14-fold, and the dollar depreciated by 20%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the two don't <laughs> the, match. The two don't have any relationship. Other than the fact that the higher prices go, since we now import two-thirds of our oil, the weaker the dollar gets. Mm -hmm. But there's, so there's, a, there's potentially a tiny bit of cut of causality. Is that the, whatever the word is? Yes. Um, the chicken and egg. But it sure it isn't anything to do with, and then the dollar strengthens and oil prices go down. If there's anything we should have learned about the asthma problem, the financial meltdown, is that free market efficiency was a myth. Mm -hmm. That was a rogue market. Well, and bringing up just in time, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have talked about how that is the salvation of the economy, yeah. is that you don't carry inventory. Yeah. Uh, They're forgetting about the four miles per gallon travel of gasoline. Correct. In that system, you can't have just in time inventory. Well, and also we have some price controls here because if the prices go up, there's price gouging, screaming, mm -hmm. and station managers don't want to get into that particular issue. Yeah. So the prices haven't gone high enough to attract trucks from other areas that have a surplus of supply currently. What are those areas? Well, I'm not really sure, but we do have we prices just, coming down yeah, in yeah. certain markets, which yeah. doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Uh, dealing is this is a nationwide system and we have scarcity of supply. I would be remiss in, ask, in not asking also about some of these alternatives. Uh, I know you're working on a project in Maine offshore mm -hmm. that, while it doesn't really deal with the transportation issue. Uh, my, has, don't, don't, don't jump to a conclusion. Oh, well, tell me more. What, what I helped get organized um, that was sort of a pipe dream three years ago is actually now attracting some of the smartest people I've ever run across. What this Ocean Energy Institute was in paper supposed to do is get a group of leading authorities from a, all walks of life to start examining every aspect of energy that it resides in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And on a kind of systematic basis, kind of a clearinghouse. I ran across George Hart because he sent me a letter thanking us for restoring the Strand Theater. Okay. I have any idea who this guy was. And he said, uh, he said I spent half my year in Tenants Harbor, which is about 10 miles south of Rockland. And then he said, you know, I just heard that you're the same person that's, that I keep reading about in the local papers that's doing this Ocean Energy Institute. I would love to get involved. I'm a systems engineering design background. It turns out that George Hart went to uh, MIT for his undergraduate degree. He got his PhD at the University of Maine. In the last 25 years, his career has been designing weapons systems. He's the architect of SDI, Star Wars. And isn't he also the one that shot down the satellite? Yeah, well, that was his. He didn't shoot the satellite down, but he invented the laser missile. Wow. What George has basically discovered through plowing through NOAA records 
is that in the Gulf of Maine during the winter, we have possibly the highest sustained winter winds in the Western Hemisphere. And so what we're now working on is perfecting exactly how they should be designed and what materials in about a 20 mile area, about 20 miles offshore Mount Desert Island, mm -hmm. which is still just on the edge of state waters, so you can stay outside the garbly gook of the MMS. Yes. Um, about 90 platforms or caissons, and they'll stick about 20 feet outside the water, and on those caissons will be 300 meter wind blades. Wow. And 90 of them in the winter will produce an, the ele winter electricity equivalent of five nuclear plants. That's incredible. It's astonishing. I mean, this is the biggest energy project that, and, and basically uh, the, the plan, the, the reason that we're gonna do this is that, we, is that Maine is the most exposed state in the United States for vulnerability to heating oil. Okay. 80% of all of the structures, residential structures, commercial structures in Maine, have only one form of heat other than fireplaces in the winter, home heating oil. And home heating oil is a product that is gonna essentially get real scarce. It's not, it's not going to be expensive, it's going to be scarce. So we have about a five to seven year window to wean Maine off home heating oil, or we basically have to evacuate most of Maine. During the winter? During the winter. That's what the platforms are designed to do, is obsolete home heating oil. And when you put it in those terms, you can't believe how many people in Maine are now wildly enthusiastic about this. Like this idea. But what's really even more interesting is that we'll, in the summer the winds die down. They're gentle winds. But they're big enough wind output to have enough electricity that we don't need for heating oil in the summer that we're going to basically start serious experimentation with using that electricity to go through electrolysis and finally end up with liquid ammonia. Okay. And liquid ammonia with some additives to dummy it down, have a, have, there's some, there are a handful of people that seem to know what they're talking about that argue that that is probably the only vi viable replacement for motor gasoline and diesel. I see. And so that's the holy grail. So there 